Good morning. Good morning, everybody. We would encourage you all to take your seat at this time so we can get started with our next session. Uh, we're continuing on with the theme of security here in room 252. Uh, and I'd love to introduce Drew Fisher, our next speaker, who, we, who will be discussing designing secure systems. There is time for Q&A at the end of this talk, so save your questions for the end. Let's all give a big round of applause to Drew. Hi everybody, I'm excited to be here today. Uh, this talk is going to be about building secure systems with object capabilities, which may be a thing that many of you have never heard of before. So I'll go over each of these uh, things in detail. But first you may be wondering, who is this guy? I'm Drew Fisher. I did my graduate studies at UC Berkeley in computer science. I studied human-computer interaction and security because I have a deep interest in usable security. My day job is at Sandstorm.io, where I work on a platform to make it super easy to self-host apps. And under the hood, Sandstorm uses object capabilities to deliver on these usability and security promises. And in my free time, I enjoy writing and playing in puzzle hunts. And I've built a series of Berkeley Mystery Hunt websites using Python. So this talk will cover what object capabilities are, what they're good for, how they can be used to improve your software design for security and usability, and a couple quick examples and applications to demonstrate uh, what they're capable of. So what is an object capability? A capability is an unforgeable, communicable, token of authority, which references an object, and a set of access rights. So a capability is a handle to something that you have authority to uh, interact with that you couldn't have come up with on your own that also has some interface that you can invoke some methods on. So let, let's look at each of those in detail. Unforgeable. Unforgeable means that we can only obtain one of these through the intended means. Uh, for a system where everything is running within some platform, this could be enforced by the platform. For something where you might be using this software on the internet or somewhere where you don't have a fixed platform, you might use some very long secret ID that you couldn't forge or accidentally come up with again before the heat death of the universe. Capabilities are communicable. This is one of their very distinctive properties. The idea that they can be transferred between agents to support delegation. Uh, I, I want to quote Mark Stiegler, a longtime capability enthusiast here. Uh, he writes, the truth of the matter is delegation cannot be prevented. The further truth of the matter is, we do not appreciate how fortunate it is that delegation cannot be prevented. Because in fact, delegation is the cornerstone of civilization. And I'm going to make the argument that software that can't support delegation is software which can't support real world workflows. Thank you. Are we good? Test, test, one, two, three. Okay. So communicability is something that we'll come back to, uh, but it's a very important property. A capability is a token of authority, so that means that we do an access check before we issue a capability. Uh, the capability represents that you already have authorization to use this resource. And the capability refers to some object, some resource, and the access rights to it within which your requests to that resource may be made. So that, that was all kind of broad, hand-wavy, and uh, abstract, but why do we care about these properties? There is a big usability idea, which I mentioned earlier, capability handles may be transferred between actors to support different workflows. But more importantly, Capabilities can be generated dynamically at runtime to express behavior that's impossible to express with just static ACLs. 
And this is valuable because users understand specific nouns and delegation. If they have a folder, they expect that they should be able to share it. If they have a document, they expect that they should be able to collaborate on it by sharing access to it. And software that can't support these kinds of workflows just can't support users as well. There are also some big security benefits. Uh, we want to make the principle of least authority practical. The principle of least authority is a statement that software should have no more access than that which is necessary to accomplish its goal, to accomplish its purpose. And one way that software can violate this is by having more access than it strictly needs. Then when a bug is found in the software, it is able to fool that software into using some excess access that it might have had that it didn't really need to cause some harm to the system. And that's undesirable. But it's also difficult to do in the context of static access controls because our needs as humans tend to be very dynamic. So one big security idea is that we want to make the principle of least authority practical. Another piece is that we want to make it hard or even impossible to express unauthorized actions. So that's the flip side of the coin. If you can only express actions which, which are authorized, then even if your program is malicious, then it can't actually accomplish anything which harms a user without their consent. And so in this way, we can remove whole classes of vulnerabilities. Path traversal is almost entirely a problem caused because paths are forgeable. And the other big benefit of using object capability security for security is that we can reuse object-oriented design patterns. People understand, developers tend to understand this, in, this concept of encapsulation, isolation, separation of concerns. If you have a reference to an object, you can call methods on it. And what object capability security does is it takes those same patterns and applies them to authorization so that we can reason about them in composable, hierarchical ways. So let's take a look at some things which are capabilities. In particular, the classic example is Unix file descriptors, uh, the thing that you get back after you call open on a path. They are unforgeable. The kernel decides which file descriptor number to issue to the process that wants to open the file. And it's only meaningful within the context of the process that is using it. So that integer that you have, integer file descriptor three, doesn't mean the same thing for any other process on the system. It's scoped to just your process, which is making this request. They're transferable. A lesser known property of Unix domain sockets is that they can transport file descriptors from one process to another uh, through a syscall called send message. So what that lets you do is have a higher privileged process open a file and then send just that single file handle to a lesser privileged process to do some operations of interest to the user on it. A file descriptor is the token of authority. Once you have the file descriptor, read and write and close. Don't need to check if you are authorized to read or write uh, beyond what the capability itself uh, holds. We're doing no further access controls on the file system. If the file system changes permissions, you still have the authority to do those content reads and writes. It references an object. The kernel knows which file or sockets uh, you may have connected to this particular file descriptor. And it has some associated rights. The kernel knows which calls are legal for any given file descriptor based on what, what kind of file descriptor it is, if it's a socket or a pipe. So there are some things which are kind of capability-like, but aren't I wouldn't really call them full ca object capabilities, but use, a thing that you'll notice is that having some of these properties tends to offer some of these security uh, properties or benefits. So I'll give an honorable mention to OAuth tokens. 
OAuth tokens are not quite object references in the usual usage. People usually don't issue a separate OAuth token for each kind of action that you might be able to take against an API. They do them at the granularity of users, but there's no reason why you couldn't. They are delegatable in a sense. Uh, transferring the access token to another client uh, will continue to transfer the authority since the tokens are just copyable bits. They are unforgeable. They need to be strong random uh, tokens or else someone else may gain access to your account by guessing. And they can be limited in scope. Uh, this varies by implementation as well, how narrow or granular these things are. But you can see that one of the reasons why OAuth tokens are useful is because they have some of these properties that capabilities offer. Let's talk about some things that are definitely not capabilities. We've got file paths, which, as we mentioned before, are forgeable. I can ask to open Etsy Shadow whether I should have authorization to do so or not. Uh, in an object capability model, I wouldn't be able to express that I want to open that particular path if I don't already have permission to do so. They are communicable, but they might not mean the same thing. Uh, different paths opened, or the same path opened at two different times may actually refer to two different objects, so they're not really object references either. The, the file underneath can change out from below you. And possession of a path does not imply any access to the file contained therein, so definitely not, not a capability. Uh, most URLs are not capabilities either. They tend to be forgeable. Uh, they don't carry rights in the URL typically, but through some orthogonal authorization scheme, maybe that's a bearer token or HTTP basic auth or some cookie that you have set on that particular site. Uh, adding unforgeable cookies means now every communication with that site has this ambient authority and then we see people go through the cross-site request forgery token hoop to make sure that each one of these accesses is in fact intentional. And I'll make one exception here, which is strong random URLs like password reset links could be considered capability-like. Uh, if you think about it, the password reset link is unforgeable. It has that long random string. It's scoped to just your user. Having the link is sufficient to reset your password and gain a user session. Fits. So let's, let's compare capabilities and access control lists in a like actual possible real world setup. So we've got our three actors, Alice, Bob, and Carol. Maybe they're all employees at the same company. Um, they can all read Etsy password, which has just the list of users on the system. Alice can read home Alice secret.txt. And Alice and Bob are currently collaborating on home Alice shared.txt. So we, we can look at this and see this access control matrix. Yes means you have privilege to that file, and no means you don't. And we can think about access control lists as being the columns in this table, and capabilities as, starting out at least, being the rows in this table. So with ACLs, each resource has the, a list of principles and what access level they may have. So we can see the, the top green box is the access control list for Etsy password. Each one of our uh, users can access it, and so on with uh, the other two files. And then in capabilities, we, we've turned that around. The arrows go the opposite direction, and that makes all the difference. So you can see that Alice has access to exactly the same set of things, and Bob has access to the exact same set of things, and Carol has access to the same set of things. But what's crucial here is that with object capabilities, you can create new subjects at runtime, which means that Bob, uh, so they're working on this project, Alice and Bob and Carol, and Alice is going out of town. And Bob needs to share something with Carol and get her feedback on it. And it happens to be 
home alice shared dot txt. What, what happens? Carol doesn't have access under the ACL model, and Alice is the owner of that, uh, that access control list, so Bob can't modify it. Bob can't delegate that access to Carol. So what Bob does is Bob works around the system. Bob makes a copy of the file, shares that with Carol, and then has to go through a bunch of work to reconcile the changes back later after Carol makes her changes. Or if you want to go one step further and say, uh, we, we've DRM'd this and now uh, uh, Bob can't make copies of the file. Uh, now Bob will share his credentials with Carol and everything just goes downhill because at the end of the day, Bob and Carol need to get their work done. And the system needs to support whatever it is that they need to do to get there. So in the access control list where ev everything is sad and Bob and Carol have to resort to these hoops, in capabilities, Bob can just make a new capability that is derived from his access to home alice shared.txt and send that on to Carol. And then Carol can dynamically access this file even though Alice didn't need to be involved in the passing on of that authority. And because this authority was derived from uh, Alice initially, Alice shared it with Bob, if Alice revokes Bob's access, then so too Carol's access should disappear. So capabilities are great. Uh, they're harder to implement wrong. They're more expressive, they're composable, they're delegatable. They allow for reasoning about uh, systems at levels of abstraction. And they allow for much finer grained controls and delegation of privilege. There are some downsides to capabilities, which I, I should also mention. There are, there, are some, there are some legitimate criticisms and then there are some inaccurate criticisms. Some inaccurate criticisms are that revocation is infeasible. You can create a capability which has a method for you and a method for the person that you're sending it to and the method for you is revoke and the method for the person you send it to simply does a no-op if uh, you have previously called revoke. So membranes and proxies can represent revocation. And as we saw in the example earlier, ACLs are not equally expressive to object capabilities. Uh, for a long time, the research community believed uh, that they were, but uh, it has since been corrected. Uh, note that capabilities as rows and ACLs as columns do tend to be very similar in practice, but it is easier to refactor the capabilities as rows into a more object capability system that supports greater delegation. And then there are some legitimate criticisms, which are that it can be harder to implement a capability system. You have to think about all these access control rules from the, from the get-go, and that means that if you're just trying to make a site that has some interesting thing on it, if you haven't thought about users or multi-tenancy, then it might take a little more effort to achieve that first success. And that's, that's a legitimate challenge. I think in the long run, the lower barriers of uh, code maintenance outweigh these issues, but it's something to consider. And then they are less widely used and there's fewer examples, resources. The common design is still one of access controls in most systems. So let's look at uh, thinking with capabilities. We have a, this I uh, pulled out of a uh, Django app that I'd written once upon a time. And it's pretty simple, it just looks at the this particular route looks at all the users, lists them, and renders a template. And the thing to notice is it's got that at staff member required decorator. But if it didn't, then I would be exposing this to everyone in the world. And it's pretty hard, actually. Uh, much harder to detect code that is absent than present code that is incorrect. Because you, you have to think about what should be rather than being able to look at what is. So how might we make this better? One option would be to 
don't even think about routes until after you've done authentication. And then only specify routes that your current level of auth authentication and authorization permit you to see. So then instead of organizing things, each route with a decorator, you might organize things by what privilege class they have. This is a straw man. I don't think uh, you can actually do this out of the box with Django, although I'd be interested to talk to some Django folk uh, to see if this is a thing that could be done. But the, the nice thing here is you have these routes by different route classes, and if you, for some reason, had the admin user's list route in the anonymous routes, you'd probably notice that in the code review pretty quickly. So moving on, we'll talk a little bit about PyCap'n'P, which is a Python library that provides bindings for Cap'n Proto, Cap'n Proto is itself an object capability and RPC system, which also sports some insanely fast uh, data serialization. The, the way you use it is you define an object interface and a schema in a Cap'n P file, and then you import that schema in your Python code, and you can create a client and make requests on that client object just as function calls. Or you can implement the calls for a server by extending uh, one of the objects defined from the cap and p module. And I'm going to skip the examples because I don't think we quite have enough time to look at them in super detail. But one of the things that we do at Sandstorm is we convert HTTP requests into cap and proto RPC requests. And we use that to sit in between the user's browser and the app that they are actually connecting to so that we can expose that app through an object capability layer, which lets us do all of this cool sharing and delegation uh, stuff. So we can make any app shareable with anyone else. We can enforce roles and permissions so the app can't get it, it wrong. And it winds up being really good for users. So web session is an interface that we've produced to uh, do gets, posts, deletes, whatnot. Uh, we also have, I, I think this next example makes an interesting case for why subdividing authority is very useful. IP network is our interface which represents the ability to connect to any host on the internet over TCP or UDP. And it has these two methods, get remote host or get remote host by name, which let you connect to an IP address or a host name with DNS resolution. And each returns an IP remote host, which is a capability that lets you connect to just that one host over any port that you may choose. But from there, you can also narrow things down by TCP port or UDP port and get just a single TCP port, which lets you connect to just that single host on that single port. And that, that's a much smaller piece of authority. This TCP port you connect your own byte stream to, and it gives you a byte stream back that you can write to. And so it just becomes an encapsulation of a socket. But the capability model makes it feasible for us to subdivide this authority and transfer appropriate privilege in a smaller scope. So there's really no reason that you need to give programs full network access when just a TCP port will do. And that's really the, the promise of object capabilities. You can take things which used to need a lot of authority to function and actually give them the least authority and follow that principle of least authority. So to summarize, Capabilities can improve security and usability. If you want to learn more, I have a couple of excellent pieces of theory reading for you. Otherwise, I'll take any questions. We have five minutes for questions and a microphone, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring it over to you all the way in the back. Do you want to meet me halfway? So
So how do I migrate from one to the other? Slowly and over time. Uh, so <laughs> The, the first thing, uh, th that was what I hope to demonstrate with the example of the staff member required uh, doing things by, instead of specifying access controls, specifying capabilities. It is difficult to switch once you have a system which expresses things in terms of one versus the other. Sandstorm gets around this for HTTP by putting every HTTP session on a randomized host name and which we require an infinite supply of. So being able to namespace everything that currently exists into a new namespace and then put new things into other non-colliding namespaces is a good way to start. Uh, how does Cap'n Proto help you with capabilities? Cap'n Proto is, allows you to express capabilities at the type system layer. So one great thing is all, all of these things, it looked like these were each uh, going from IP network down to util.bytestream. It looked like each one of those was a function call, which ordinarily in an RPC system will incur a round trip. But if your type system is expressive enough to understand these, you can do what's called promise pipelining, which removes round trips for things which are expressed as these specific types. So you could do that all in a single round trip with Promise Pipelining. It also lets you express these from various languages. Uh, Cap'n Proto has bindings from a variety of languages. We use it in C++, Rust, JavaScript, and Python. Under the capability, under the capability model, how would you, sorry, under the capability model, how do you go about enumerating who has access to a capability at the moment? I, I couldn't hear that. Can you speak up? Uh, under this model, how do you enumerate who has access to a particular object? That is the perhaps the other challenge. Uh, you can trace the tree of capability grants between actors and aggregate them. It is less easy to give a good or the same UI that you might get with an access control list, but I argue that the complexity involved there is partly the human complexity involved of the dynamic nature of needing to share access. And that concludes our period, our time for questions. So let's give Drew one big round of applause. And thank you.